Welcome back to this collaboration between the FIU Radcliffe Art and Design Incubator and Inspicho Arts. I hope I said it right again this time. I want to uh, let, first of all, the ones that are watching us um, today, I am doing this with um, Professor Raymond. We call him Ray Elman. Um, and I'm here at the FIU Radcliffe Art and Design Incubator. This is the background. You can see a little bit of what it looks like. So I just wanted to mention that because it is quite a, a creative and innovative and unique space here at the FIU BBC campus. So welcome in um, back, uh, Professor Ray Elman. Um, it's a pleasure to be talking with you. We're doing, this is our second session. So we're moving forward with this um, project every week. And this week, I'm actually excited to be um, talking about it. I mean, all your guests are incredibly uh, unique, innovative, and have a sense of entrepreneurship, which is also the essence and the spirit um, of FIU Radcliffe. So Paul Saltzman is a filmmaker, photographer, and writer. He's a creative, he's made over 60 movies. And in your interview, which is amazing as a matter of fact, and I hope everyone will, will see it, there's two events in his life in the timeline that we're going to be talking about. And I wanna start with the first one, which is captivating. Um, I've only met one other person that has actually met, um, you know, the Beatles in person and has actually sat down with them. Um, but that's a conversation for you and I for another time. Um, but um, let's talk about his encounter and his love for India and a moment in his life that he is going through heartbreak. And he, you know, approaches an ashram and finds out that he can't be let in because the Beatles are in there. You know, his mind is somewhere else because of what he's going through. So he doesn't really care whether they're there or not. Take us through what he told you um, happened there because he does ultimately get into the ashram and runs into the Beatles and spends a number of days where he's able to, you know, talk to them and get a real feel for who they are. Their, their, their wives, their girlfriends are there. Mia Farrow's there, Cynthia Lennon, John Lennon's um, first wife is there. So take us a little bit through that, that timeline. So it, it was an extraordinary thing for a young man. He was in his 20s and he was coming from Toronto. And the, the reason he got to India was that he was feeling this emptiness and he heard an inner voice say, if you're not happy here, go somewhere else. And he heard himself say out loud, where should I go? And the inner voice said, India. So he goes over there not knowing anything about India. Um, and then he gets a Dear John letter from his girlfriend breaking up with him and he's in even more pain. And somebody says, you should go meditate. So he goes, he said, where should I do that? And they send him to Maharishi Mahesh Yogi's ashram. And he, as you said, when he gets there, it's closed because the Beatles are there. And he says, well, can I wait? And they said, yeah, okay. And so he sat by the side of the road for eight days while they brought him food, but they wouldn't let him in. And then finally they let him in and he has some lunch there. And he, when he walks out of the lunch, he sees the Beatles all having lunch under a tree at a big table with some other people like Mia Farrow and Donovan and some of their girlfriends and wives. And he goes over and John Lennon looks up and he said, may I, and Paul says, may I join you? And John Lennon says, sure mate, pull up a chair. And Paul McCartney says, here, take this one. And they make room for him, sits down at the table. And they start teasing him, as he says, in their Lily Pudlian way of, because they always made jokes with each other. They were really almost like a group of brothers. And they were, you know, their intimacy was very clear. And they brought him into their circle. And they're all taking pictures of one another. And he says, do you mind if I take some pictures? And he wasn't even a photographer then. He just happened to have an old Pentax camera. And he starts taking pictures. And, you know, they, they, they said, sure, we don't mind at all. And those formed the basis of an extraordinary group of photographs that he will be exhibiting on September 23rd at the Betsy Hotel in Miami Beach. And he also had some film footage, which he turned into a movie called The Beatles in India. And uh, uh, that's available now to watch. And that's an extraordinary film. And the so other- I have a question for you, Ray. So, you know, he, I know he says in, in the interview that the Beatles are as just down to earth and normal as it gets. I mean, is that something that um, you think talking to him, he was able to kind of extract from that encounter? I, absolutely. And I, I think uh, it, 
since he's listening to the voice in his head, he, 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 he at one point, while he's calmly walking over to, to introduce himself, he hears, eek, it's the Beatles. <laughs> but he never acted that way. And in fact, he didn't even think of it. He could have taken a million more pictures, but he didn't even think, oh, this is never going to happen again. <laughs> so, so I should take ton, as many pictures as I'll let me take. He wasn't even thinking that way. He was just thinking them, to your point, as being regular guys, because that's the way they, they didn't act like they were, uh, as John Lennon once said, more famous than Jesus. And, and so they just acted like, uh, you know, there was no big head, there was no sense of celebrity. And so it was a wonderful experience for him. Do you, is there a specific reason that he even said or, or has an idea of why the Beatles let, let him into the inner circle? Or is it just a chance encounter? I think it's a chance encounter, but it just shows, uh, you know, if I'm guessing from afar, 40 years, 50 years later, uh, it's that, you know, we're in this strange country and we're going through this uh, experience of becoming more spiritual. And so acting like a celebrity, and also there's no, you know, there aren't thousands of girls screaming all around them, you know, so it's a very peaceful setting. And I just think that, uh, uh, you know, it was easy for them to act that way. I mean, it's incredible because you hear few accounts of people that have actually seen them in these settings and approached them and, and, and all the, the feedback and the conversations of people that have had these encounters with the Beatles um, are similar. It's super down to earth, even though they created, you know, a movement in time, if you want to call it that. But there's another and, and I would I would even add to that, that to me, what's more even more extraordinary about the Beatles than we realized at the time is how talented and diverse that, that they were and how uh, you know you can look at one you can listen to one album and every song sounds different from the next whereas today every song sounds sounds the same it could be from 20 different artists and they all sound the same so i i think we underestimated how great they were uh, when they were a unit yeah, I mean, they had a unique sound and a unique look for, for the time period that, that this was happening. And I think that's what made them stand out. So what is the other event that takes place, and I'll mention Mississippi, that kind of, um, you know, affects Paul Saltzman? Talk about that. So again, Paul was still in his 20s, and he was up in Toronto when um, Goodman... Cheney and Schwerner, three, three civil rights workers, freedom writers, were murdered in Mississippi for registering black voters. And that shook up a lot of people. And in fact, Bob Dylan wrote a song about that era, um, or several probably. And he decided on, on his own to go down on his own nickel and uh, help out and become a freedom writer. And he, was, he first went to a workshop with Stokely Carmichael, who was head of SNCC, which was everybody in, from that era had heard of Stokely Carmichael and SNCC, Student Non-Action, Nonviolent uh, Coordinating Committee. And uh, then he went down there and he saw a sign that said, uh, White Citizens Council meeting tonight. So he said, oh, I'll put on a tie and I'll go to that meeting, thinking he wouldn't stand out. Well, he's walking up the stairs to the meeting and a guy from the Ku Klux Klan punches him in the face and he goes spinning around and some other Ku Klux Klan members start chasing him. And as he puts it, fortunately, I was athletic and fast and I outran them and got away. 43 years later, he goes back to Mississippi and finds the guy who punched him in the face and gets him to sit down over a five year period and do interviews, video interviews, which he records and turns into a movie called The Last White Night. And what you see is that the guy who punched him in the face is the personification of evil. They're actually acting like they're old friends, almost like it's a high school reunion. And uh, the Ku Klux Klan guy, whose name is Dele Dele Beckwith, 
uh, is smirking and laughing and says terrible things. Um, and yet uh, he was able to talk to him for five years. And it turned out that Dela Beckwith's father is the guy who shot Medgar Evers in the back. And Bob Dylan had the song the day they shot Medgar Evers in the back. That's the same family. So it, it was extraordinary. And in his movie, he also has uh, Morgan Freeman, who was a civil rights activist in Mississippi at the time he grew up in Mississippi, and um, uh, Harry Belafonte, uh, the singer and actor. And so they're part of his movie, as is John Lewis, the uh, politician who was, a, of course, a major civil rights actor. After he had made the movie and showed the movie to Morgan Friedman, Morgan Freeman didn't comment. He didn't say anything to him about the movie. He didn't say that's great. You know, amazing movie. He didn't say anything. Years, a few years later, they happened to be together in Toronto. And Morgan Freeman out of the blue said, I could have never have done what you, you did. I couldn't have sat down with that guy and talked to him without punching him in the face. You know? So let me ask you, he, he, was, he looked for this person to get some type of apology or just- Well, I, I think, you know, Paul is an extreme, Paul became a very spiritual person when he was in India and he's made 60 trips to India. He takes groups over there, among other things. And so he, he asked the question that, is there a time, are people so- are they clinging so tightly to their beliefs that there's no room to have a discussion, a peaceful discussion? And so that's what he did with this guy, even though this guy never showed any remorse, never showed that he changed at all. Um, he did say that his kids were more tolerant. And I actually asked Paul, did he, did he, uh, did he have a chance to interview the kids? And they said they wouldn't talk to him. And I don't know why, but you can, you can guess. Uh, but, but, but the main reason is Paul's one of those people who wants to find common ground and, uh, and believe in humanity.